Hello and welcome. Uh, Hi, Minister, greetings. Prime Minister, great that, uh, to have you here. So today we would like to get some thoughts from you on how you see the world. And so we start start right away. I'm Melissa Eddy, a journalist with the New York Times, US American, but I've been living in Germany for quite some time. This transatlantic story though and the German-American partnership has become a very interesting question now. So my question for you, you called yourself as pro-transatlantic and that this relationship is very important for you. But what does that really mean for you? What does this mean to be pro-transatlantic nowadays? So when you say that, of course, first of all, there's a long life tradition, something you carry with you. You grew up that way. My city of Aachen, for example, was the first city that was liberated from the West as early as October 1944. And that's why, since my youth, this narrative, we were liberated by the Americans, was uh, the one we learned growing up. That was then solidified by the following political events, by following political events after that. We knew that the transatlantic relationship, especially until 89, 90, until reunification, guaranteed freedom and security for Germany. Well, it was, but is it still? Well, be careful here. It's important to describe what was, to then get to what is. Uh, the task then was to shape the time after 1990. And again, it was known that in this changing world, after the fall of the wall, after the end of the Cold War, that we can only succeed if we work with the U.S. together, with which we had uh, very close relationships in many areas, science, culture, values, and many more. And we can only do this together. So then you have those ups and downs, including in American politics. We're now at a time, after the pandemic as well, where we know there's a dispute over the idea of what society should look like. You have a country like China, which handled the pandemic, yes, but by author authoritarian means. And we want to show, as a liberal Western democracy, we want to show that we can do this too, with our liberal ideals of humanity. And there, the US is our partner. The new president speaks of a coalition of Democrats, of those who share the same idea of humanity. And we're here in our federal state's representation in Berlin. We always call it the embassy of the West. And that, that doesn't just mean North Rhine-Westphalia, but also the values of the West, of the West, which are just different than those in many other regions of the world. But how do you convey these values? How do you carry them out into the world? What does that mean? So it's very well to talk about it. But for example, you see that China distributes much more vaccines around the world than the West does. Yeah, this is a competition we have to accept. In the Cold War, it was like this. We had our moral stance and we had the superior economic system. And in the end, this was one of the reasons why communism collapsed. Now we're experiencing a state that has different values and that is also economically successful. So it's a completely different situation, which makes this competition of systems more demanding. And that's why, when it comes to vaccines, artificial intelligence, many new technologies, why we have to be on the cutting edge so that our ideals, our conception of humanity will become formative. For example, if you develop artificial intelligence, you can use social scoring and monitor the entire population. Or you can be on the same technological level, but develop other standards, different standards that are more appropriate for human beings. And Europe can only do that together. And actually, Europe can only do it with the transatlantic partner. And that's how you can see the transatlantic relations suddenly mean increased opportunities for action in the world. The same applies to peace-related policy activities. When you and I just met the Belarusian opposition leader. So when you put pressure on a dictatorship, it's easier if Europe and the United States act together. And that applies in many regions of the world. Well, let's stick to that for a moment. We'll come back to China in a moment, but let's uh, stick to this alliance, which also includes NATO. 
You are very strongly in favor that Germany should stick to its 2% target, even if some of your opponents might think that this is more time. America, of course, is very much in favor. Why do you take this position on so clearly that 2% is important in NATO? First of all, it's important, uh, important because we agreed on it. It's always good that countries stick to what they agree to. That's why the 2% target is one that's necessary in order to ensure the security of the alliance as a whole. And this can't just be done with words. And Germany must have deployable forces if it wants to make a, its contribution to the alliance. And under Article 5, we expect the alliance to stand by us if we're in need. And then you yourself have to make your own contribution as well. Well, what does that also, would that also mean that you would be prepared for the German military to take on a stronger role in the world? Because to date, uh, Germany is seen as rather reserved. People always say that, but I don't think so. The Bundeswehr has been in Afghanistan for years now, for example. Many uh, German servicemen and women have lost their lives there, including in missions that were quite robust. And in this respect, Germany has actually changed. Germany had a different tradition after the Second World War. And for Germany, it was a very big step to be present in Afghanistan. We're present in Mali together in a mission. And it simply depends on the question, what is the mission? What is the task? And there, I think, Germany's role can be strengthened. If necessary, we can do more. But of course, we have to evaluate each individual mission. Well, you just mentioned Russia and Belarus. You had a conversation with Ms. Tikhanovskaya. So this is all about the big question of democracy, which takes us to Russia. We do have Belarus, and, but of course we also have uh, Navalny, the case Navalny, the pressure that Putin is exerting on the Russian opposition. So far... Germany has always relied on dialogue. Do you think that this suffices actually to convey all the values that you just mentioned? The U.S. has also focused on dialogue. And if I understand it correctly, the American president will meet with the Russian president over the next few days. And this is always the right way to conduct foreign policy, even with countries with which one might have multiple conflicts and lots of disagreements. Still, to remain in dialogue and talk to them. But has that been of any use? If you look at the Minsk Protocol, for instance, so people are talking and talking, but... Well, no, no, no. The Minsk process did at least have the effect of freezing the conflict, which could have escalated into a major warlike conflict. It has not been resolved. Russia must leave occupied eastern Ukraine. But the, the Minsk process transformed the conflict that really threatened to escalate at the time and transformed it into a political process. Not yet satisfactorily, of course, because whenever conflicts exist, they are not quickly resolved. But it is better to talk, including in the Normandy format, Germany and France and Russia and Ukraine, than not to talk at all. Because then the law of the strongest applies, and that's uh, the wrong way to go. Well, you just mentioned France, a really important partner for Germany historically, of course. But uh, of lately, France has tried a lot with Europe and to bring Europe forward, and uh, Germany was not always there. What do you think about that? And do you want to make things differently if you were Chancellor? First of all, I do believe that Germany was there. There was the famous speech by President Macron at the Sorbonne, where it was always said, Germany responded too late. Now, the Chancellor's style is different from that of Emmanuel Macron. She's always thought very carefully about what's realistic, what could we implement, and, uh, and a result a year and a half after Sir Bond's speech is the Aachen Treaty, an important document that translates the old Elysee Treaty into the present day, with very specific areas where we want to work together. So in this respect, Germany has also played its part. Nevertheless, I believe that we need a, a, after the pandemic, that we need a new dynamic in the European processes. On May 9, the process on the future of Europe was launched. And I can even imagine 
that we will make another attempt, including in the foreign policy arena, to move away from unanimity to majority voting, and that we can again imagine treaty amendments for more Europe. Well, what does more Europe actually mean? We hear that every so often. What, what does it look like? Well, that's really quite simple. In foreign policy, majority decision-making, a joint European action. In domestic policy, we need more jurisdiction and responsibility for the fight against international terrorism and international crime. They have long cooperated across borders. And we're still just reacting with nation-state patterns. So I think we need more competence there in research and development of artificial intelligence or all the other topics I mentioned in the beginning, we need to pool our resources. After the pandemic, we have to take a joint approach to preventive health care. It must never again happen that we depend on a foreign power, just depend on a foreign power, in this case China, for the cheapest kind of fabric masks, and that we're willing to pay any price just to maintain our hospitals. So becoming self-sufficient in Europe is one of the tasks we do have. So what would be your style? More like Macron, big visions, or more like Merkel, wait and see? Laschet style. What? How do you see yourself? Laschet style, exactly. Well, we don't know that yet because we are not uh, from North Rhine-Westphalia. What is the Laschet style? So a little bit from everyone involved. I think Angela Merkel's sobriety has helped sometimes. On European issues, I have more of Macron's passion. Maybe it has to do with where I come from. If you come from Aachen, then, um, then Paris is closer to you than Berlin, distance-wise. You grew up in this Carolingian Europe. Then you have those close sensibilities that shaped Helmut Kohl, very similar to those. And Helmut Kohl advanced Europe with a passion even with visions. And he did one thing above all. He also took into account the smaller countries. He took them along. It was never a concert of just the big ones, never just Germany and France. He got along very well with Mitterrand, but he also included the people from Luxembourg, from Belgium, from the Netherlands, and today the Poles, the Hungarians, the Czechs, in these major proceedings. Exactly. That will be the next question. Poland, Hungary, Slovenia. All of these are European partners where we would, with Eng in English, where we say democratic backsliding witness. So democracy is not as highly held as in Germany or France at the moment. How do you want to bring them back on board? Or do you see this, this is no longer necessary? No, no, it's urgently necessary. After the pandemic, we prevented Northern and Southern Europe from falling uh, away from each other with this big recovery fund. For the first time, the European Union is buying bonds, something that's never happened before. Because we all know that the single market will only work if Greece, Italy, Spain, France also are strong. If any one of them falls off, the whole single market is at risk. And the pandemic was nobody's fault. And that's why the Solidarity uh, Pact is right at this time. The North-South divide has been bridged, but the East-West divide has not been bridged. And that's why I think we have to adhere to the principles of the rule of law, because um, European law applies, including to Poland and Hungary. But we still need ways to understand these countries, including with their own history and and to include them uh, again a little more strongly in European processes. This applies to both Hungary and Poland, to name just uh, those two for now. Yeah, but how can you succeed to do so? This can be achieved through talks, through engagement, by involving them in certain initiatives. There are many initiatives in security policy, for example, where Poland and Germany have the same interests, where Poland is a strong NATO partner. So to use this to facilitate an open discussion in other fields too, where there are conflicts, to, to make an open discussion possible and to signal that we don't want to, to treat you from the top down, from Brussels. And that's because there is a, a great sensitivity, especially in the states of the former Warsaw Pact, because the idea of freedom was connected with the idea of national independence. This is very strong with the Poles and Hungarians. And to recognize this, and nevertheless, to see the big European idea, 
For that, you need many discussions and ideas and trust. Well, we, that brings us back to talks. Now, trust, what else? You can't decide by majority vote that you have to take in refugees if a whole society doesn't support that. But you then have to find other acts where you demand solidarity. And if I take the polls, for example, yes, when it comes to the refugee issue, to the distribution of refugees, they don't participate in that. But they make their own contribution when it comes to refugees from Ukraine, from Belarus. That's where Poland and the Baltic states are always the first port of call. And we in the West don't see that often enough because we only look at the allocation of refugees from the Mediterranean. That's why I believe we must recognize what these countries are doing too. You, men you mentioned community loans. Mrs. Merkel said that that should be a one-off. Do you see it as a one-off contribution too? Or is maybe the door still open, so to speak, so that it could be further developing? At this time, we're doing it once. And it remains so. Well, yeah, this is a financial projection for six years that we agreed upon there, meaning until the year 2027. And I think the message that it is a one-time act is right. You mentioned China also, the China Silk Road actually ends uh, in your neighborhood in Duisburg. And now you spoke more often about China as a system competitor. What does this actually mean? Yeah, China is always both a system competitor and of course in some cases also partner, uh, economic relations for example. Well, how do you reconcile these two things? Well, that's what's difficult. The Silk Road has two sides too. The first one is that it speeds up trade ro uh, routes. So the train that goes from the port of Duisburg in Germany to Xiongping in the middle of China shortens the routes that would otherwise take a week longer, going across the uh, oceans of the world and the Suez Canal and also ending up in Duisburg. So it's an efficient promotion of trade that benefits both sides. So that's okay to that extent. What's not okay is when the Silk Road is used to take over critical infrastructure in African countries in order to exert political influence. Or the port of Piraeus. And from the port of Piraeus to basically extend uh, influence across the entire Balkans. That's where Europe has to make sure that trade is not manifested um, in political influence. Incidentally, speaking of the port of Piraeus, and this was partly our fault because we forced the Greeks to sell the port of Piraeus and the Chinese bought it up. So sometimes you have to think long term in your actions. And the same thing is happening right now with the vaccine. Dependency is created for Africa with the vaccine, something that we have to recognize, and therefore the initiative of the American president to unconditionally ship vaccine, including to Africa and other regions, is right, and Europe should follow his lead. Let's come back to the idea that China bought up a lot of companies. A lot of SMEs fear for their future for this reason, actually, that China will always be so powerful. So what would you like to say, what would you do to support and protect these SMEs? All right, we need reciprocity in trade between Germany and China. That means we have to be economically active there. But the conditions are usually such there that a Chinese partner must always remain in control, be the main person controlling everything. And what is conceded there must also, there must also apply here, which is why we must not allow the core substance of Germany's mid-sized companies, the Mittelstand, to be uh, bought up without consideration. Global trade always involves holding international shares in companies, something that's done by American and European companies too. But then on a reciprocal base, uh, reciprocal basis, and this is not always the case with China. In fact, it's usually not the case. Well, speaking about America, let's come back to America. So Joe Biden is really going towards the transformation to climate neutrality, which is one of the major goals of his new administration. China is doing exactly the same. So how do you see Germany's future here? Uh, many critics say that, for instance, North Rhine-Westphalia, the government is focusing too much on the interests of the industry of fossil fuels and coal industry. 
That's a complete misjudgment. Uh, I'll say something about that right um, in a second. But first, let me talk about the U.S. Yes, there's been a significant change in policy with the election of President Biden. Uh, a few days ago, I received John Kerry at the um, representation here, the climate ambassador or climate secretary of the United States. And I was deeply impressed by the way he described how the entire American society is now using all of its resources to win the fight against climate change. And it always impresses Europeans when Americans use all their resources, because that means political power, economic power, and even the power of the financial markets. So when Wall Street says that climate change is now our guiding principle, combating climate change, then that does have a certain influence in the world. And at the same time, he described to me that he wants to include Russia in that, China, many states in the world. And that is an example where you can find common ground even if you have um, opposites in your systems. And that's why it's encouraging. And I think Europe should also appoint a climate foreign minister who, like John Kerry is doing, uh, what John Kerry is doing for the United States, will join um, in this concert on behalf of Europe. So Europe is acting then and not Germany as such. Yeah, it's, it's always Europe that has to act. I mean, even Europe itself is too small to fight climate change. Europe has to do it. But Europe sets targets for each member state. And then Germany has to reach its targets. We want to achieve climate neutrality by 2045. And that's a bigger ambition than what's written in the Paris agreements. And North Rhine-Westphalia, as the, indust the industrial state in Germany, must do its part. And there is no German state that reduces CO2 like North Rhine-Westphalia. Because we're getting out of fossil fuels. We ended bituminous coal in 2018 after a 200-year industrial history. And we now have to phase out, uh, phase out of lignite. And at the same time, the will, the willingness of the steel industry, the chemical industry, to also achieve climate neutrality. So in an industrial state, as densely populated as North Rhine-Westphalia, the ambition is, of course, a different one than in a state that has no in industry at all. So in this respect, I do not share the thesis that North Rhine-Westphalia is doing too little. But can you take this over for Germany as a whole? I'm thinking of the new federal states, for instance, the Neue Länder. Yeah, yes, yes, partly. It's not transferable in terms of uh, impact because it's not bundled like that anywhere else, not concentrated steel, chemicals, aluminum, coal, like it is in North Rhine-Westphalia. But the new German states also have lignite. And they also committed to getting out. Brandenburg, Saxony, Saxony, Anhalt. And we promised that we'll help with this structural change by providing billions of euros in federal aid because they have a greater sensitivity there than in the West. We can get out even faster if we have strong industry. In the East, people experienced in 1990 that everything collapsed all at once. And lignite, too, ended abruptly in many areas at that time. And these people are now afraid that the same thing will happen again without financial help. The political right, the alternative for Germany, AFD, is also playing with this theme. And that's why we must say, yes, coal phase out, but accompanied by structural measures that ensure that regions remain viable. Well, let's change the topic. So... You mentioned Helmut Kohl earlier, who is a great role model for you. So what do you see in him, what he achieved in, for Germany, for Europe, that you could also take over for yourself as an example? Well, he came to power at the height of the debate on disarmament. I mean, he had different periods, but at first he restored Germany's reliability in the Atlantic Alliance. Helmut Schmidt internally wanted the same thing, but he no longer had a majority in his own party. Helmut Kohl completed what Helmut Schmidt had begun, and Germany was once again a partner in rearmament and in NATO. And then came the time of reunification. In the years of his chancellorship, he built up a close relationship with the U.S. to the American president, Reagan, and then later Bush. And this paid off when the wall fell, because... That's when it was important that this Germany was trusted, that a Germany reuniting could be accepted. And without then-President George Bush Sr., 
Mikhail Gorbachev on the other side, German unification would not have uh, succeeded. They were even more committed than our European friends. Neither François Mitterrand nor Margaret Thatcher were enthusiastic about German unity, uh, unification. But the American president helped Germany at that moment. In this respect, this cultiv cultivation of the German-American relationship is important in every regard. Helmut Kohl also helped François Mitterrand find new impetus for the Franco-German dynamic. And uh, he then worked toward uh, the single market, toward the Maastricht Treaty, the common currency, toward the common foreign and security policy. In other words, in the short period from just before unification to 1992, he built a new foundation in Europe. And, um, well, and that is your model, your, the idea of building a new foundation for Europe. Yes, I think it's exemplary, but this is a different task now that we face. Uh, but uh, this strong Europe will also be needed in the new era. Another big factor in your life is the Catholic Church. You recently on a Twitter platform congratulated Cardinal Marx for offering his uh, resignation to the Pope. How do you think your faith influences your political style and also your actions in the world? Well, I'm not someone who constantly practices politics with Bible verses. In Germany, the reluctance to mix religion and politics in political speeches, uh, speeches is more pronounced than it is in the US. Yet, uh, we have a party with a C in its name. Well, it always depends on what you say. Yeah, it's extraordinary, yes, but um, one experiences in America that preachers or others speak very spiritually. That's rather unusual in German politics. The commitment to this idea of men, the Christian concept of men, is of course very strong in German politics, through the party name. And yes, it did influence me. Now I see that the new American president is also a Catholic. And the connection that a Catholic is president of the United States and chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany is something that we actually last had with Konrad Adenauer and John F. Kennedy. Yeah, well, it's been a while. Yeah, it was never the case again. But now, nothing can be deduced from that. But I've noticed with President Biden, too, that this deep anchoring in his faith shapes his political actions. Very often connected with the Catholic faith is a view of the entire world, an eye toward a responsibility for the entire world. So it's not a national faith. But instead... It has to strive to shape things on the global level that is embodied in the papacy. Well, and there's this for you advice that you obviously support. Yes, I support that. Catholics are rarely nationalists because they always know that their, that their values are actually good values for the entire world. Well, one of your opponents, Mrs. Annalena Baerbock, is younger, and she talked about this old division between East and West and Germany, and here she would be the first candidate who would not really carry or support this division anymore. How important do you think is this old division for Germany, and how do you want to take the country beyond this after we had a chancellor from the east now how are you coming back out of this idea about west and east but about this new german identity if you will and beyond that maybe perhaps but why also the, your ident european identity but why does miss Baerbock embody you why do you think i don't judge this is how she sells herself how she prevents herself well, that's silly. I mean, she was born in the West, socialized in the West, and now she lives in um, Brandenburg. That does not mean that the East-West identity has been overcome. It's simply a question of residence. Plus, the mentality is no longer such that people in the younger generation sort themselves into East and West 30 years after German reunification. And I think, I mean, I come from the deepest West, since you can't go any more West than Aachen in Germany. And still, you can think about and understand the problems of the East, listen to people, perhaps even in a completely different way than um, Angela Merkel, because Angela Merkel came from the East, and she had to get involved more in the West. I believe that if someone comes from the West, he or she must listen 
to the East in a completely different way while addressing the problems of the East because it, they know that they, are, they are from the West. That's why I don't think my commitment to issues affecting all Germans will be any less. And also in your overall European thinking. Yeah, well, that's always the most important uh, thinking. In my opinion, a German uh, chancellor, if he is woken up at four o'clock in the morning and there's a crisis, he must immediately think, how do we solve it on the European level? The thing to look at must always be immediately that we won't be able to manage it alone. What about our European partners? This fundamental way of thinking always comes before national thinking. Well, I thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you as well.